Well, thank you, Diane, for that uh, generous eulogy. And uh, <laughs> good to be uh, with all of you today. Um, I especially want to thank all the folks, Sunny included, who helped launch this um, internship program. Uh, and quite simply, uh, we need your talent. The young people who are here today, I want you to seriously consider coming and working uh, in public service, uh, if not for my agency, for another uh, state agency this summer. Because what's happened since the election, California has really become, in a sense, a country. Uh, and we're really incubating the clean energy technologies of the future. And uh, it's actually very difficult to uh, attract some of the, the, the top talent we need. There's, you know, you got to be in Sacramento. It's a big challenge. Once you get in there, you can make a huge difference. And just as an example, the Stanford graduate student who worked for me last summer, Tara, we had her working on planting the seeds for all of these zero net energy codes for cities throughout the state to actually get out ahead of the state and pulling uh, our state forward. And it worked and had a huge impact. And so I want to personally ask every young person who here to, to think about that as an opportunity because, because we need you. I also want to recognize my cousin, Nicholas Hochschild, who is a, uh, a freshman here at Stanford. He's from Peru. And I think when they found out there's more Hochschilds coming, they're like, oh, God, there goes the neighborhood. I mean, how many can the state hold? Uh, but it's great to have you uh, here tonight. Um, so just to begin with, uh, you know, since the election, it was really kind of a earth-shaking development, as we all know. And there's been even a, a talk of a Cal exit you know, sort of uh, Brexit for California thing. Uh, I actually passionately oppose that idea. I think we need to not leave, we need to lead. And I actually think the whole world is looking to us to, to do that. And in fact, uh, this challenge of fighting climate change and building a clean energy future, which was hard enough before the election, has gotten even harder now. But it's also true that when we take on the very biggest challenges, it's also where I think we find the very best of the human spirit. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight and a little bit about what's happening, what some of the opportunities are, and um, be about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and we'll stop and take questions and have a, have a little discussion. So to begin with, I think we uh, actually should remember the opportunity, the, uh, the time of opportunity there is with technology. You think about, raise your hand in the audience if you have an iPhone. OK, so look around. Right? So this product uh, was invented just 10 years ago. And you think about what it is. It's a computer and a calendar and a stopwatch and a calculator, flashlight. It's a map and a tape recorder and a movie theater and a game player and a watch and music player and also a phone. We forget that part. Um, and it's gone from basically you know, not existing to being ubiquitous in a decade, right? And the same sense of opportunity is also true, I think, with uh, policy. And I take gay marriage as an example. So there was uh, gay marriage nowhere until uh, 2004. And then what you saw is state by state by state by state, it got adopted. And, and now it's, of course, in all 50 states over a very short period of time. You go back you know, 12, 13 years, and you ask you know, how many people think that by 2017, gay marriage would be universal. I think most of us would have said, you know, not, not going to happen. Uh, and I think there's actually some lessons for the climate movement in what happened with marriage equality. Because they really framed the issue really about love, actually. Government has no place to get between two people who love each other. I actually think climate change is the same thing. It's about loving the next generation. And actually, I think that uh, is a good way to, to think about it. But just bear in mind, despite all the sort of turmoil that's going on, we are in an age of enormous potential change. And, and we're seeing that with technology and policy. So to begin with, I uh, actually got into renewable energy first in 1996. I lived for a year in South Africa. I worked for President Mandela. He had a program. Um, I was there about two years, two and a half years after the end of apartheid. And one of the first things that the ANC government did when they came to power is they provided postal service to the townships. So I was in a black township on the Eastern Cape, about 30,000 people. They had no uh, mail service. And uh, Mandela came in. He, he put these postal stations with rooftop solar and battery banks. And they were lit up at night. And it became actually a gathering spot in the community. And for the first time, people could send uh, a mail around the country. 
Uh, and I got excited about uh, the potential of solar. Here you go into a place that didn't have electric service and they could have lights and so on. Uh, I got the, excited about the potential of solar uh, to grow. As I looked into it, I learned that every time global demand for solar power doubles, the price goes down by 20%. So I got excited about what we could do with that. I went on to work for Willie Brown in San Francisco. Um, funny story about Willie Brown, he was the only mayor that I know of of a major city in the United States who would keep his phone number listed in the white pages. And this woman calls him once at three in the morning to say, Mr. Mayor, my street light is out. <laughs> so he writes this down and the next morning he gets it fixed and they set his alarm for three in the morning, calls her back and says it's fixed. <laughs> So <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. Uh, 2001, we had an energy crisis in California. And in San Francisco, there were rolling blackouts. We literally had neighborhood by neighborhood, they were turning the lights off. And it, it was a real energy crisis. We now know that was not caused by anything other than market manipulation by, by Enron and others. But um, every crisis is an opportunity, right? And we decided to put a ballot measure on the city ballot to do $100 million for solar panels on public buildings and energy efficiency. Uh, and we decided to run it not as legislation, but as a ballot initiative uh, that the whole public would vote on. We did a big um, campaign and we actually did some polling. We asked of all the possible reasons why you would vote for $100 million for solar panels and energy efficiency, which is the most compelling? Is it job creation? Is it fighting climate change? Is it clean air? Is it uh, you know, something else? Uh, actually, what came back the, at the top was clean air. So that was our tagline, clean air, clean energy. And it won by 73% in November 2001. Um, and we were ultimately able actually to shut down both of San Francisco's polluting power plants. Uh, and we got now uh, solar on the, on the Moscone Convention Center and San Francisco Airport, San Francisco City Hall uh, and reservoirs, et cetera. And I went on then to work, we started a group called Vote Solar to do barrier busting uh, in other states, about 20 other states around the country uh, to create the policies necessary to encourage more uh, solar energy development. So one bit of good news that doesn't get a lot of attention, but if you look at the new generation that's being added to the grid, uh, it's mostly renewable. Uh, in 2015, 65% of new electric generation being added to the grid is, was renewable. And then, you know, of course, what's being retired is mostly coal, vast majority of coal. So things are actually going the right way and just look at the marginal uh, additions and subtractions from the grid. But um, What's maybe most significant here is, is the story of coal. This is the background of what's happening because, you know, basically in uh, the last five years, the stock value of the top um, four companies that provided the majority of American coal, okay, so this is Peabody, Arch, Alpha, and Cloud Peak Energy. These countries provided the majority of American coal, and coal was five years ago the majority of America's electricity portfolio. Their value, their combined market cap, has fallen by 99%, okay? So these companies are worth 1% of the value they had five years ago. And if you just think about the role coal has played in our world, I mean, it's extraordinary, right? It was actually the reason the British Empire was able to become as powerful as, as they did. Of course, uh, in, even in the US Civil War, coal was decisive to the outcome of that war. The North at that time had a big coal advantage uh, I think 28 to 1 coal advantage in the Civil War, and it powered Germany to, to fight and wage two world wars. Of course, it's powered our economy. Uh, and the, the beginning of the coal era, the beginning of the end of the coal era is now uh, underway. The question is, what comes next? Um, in California, I think we're showing that moving off coal and off of fossil fuels uh, can work not just for our environment, but for our economy. So. Our state's GDP has grown by 28% since 2001. Emissions have fallen by 8% and emissions per capita much more steeply. And I think this is a real case study about how you can, um, how you can you know, cut emissions and, and grow the economy at the same time. Um, this progress in California, I think I would argue is happening in spite of, uh, not because of federal energy policy over the last half century, which has heavily favored fossil fuels. And there's basically three differences between subsidies for renewables and subsidies for fossil fuels at the federal level, okay? So subsidies for fossil fuels are much more numerous. 
Um, they've been around much longer. So the oil depletion allowance started in 1926. And most importantly, the subsidies for fossil fuels typically don't expire. Okay, the subsidies for renewables, which you know, really came in just in the last 15 years or so, have had a lot of stops and starts, and they all expire. So the, we're going to lose the production tax credit, I think, in 2020. We lose the investment tax credit for solar in 2021. Uh, and so what you're seeing at the state level and this big push for renewable energy is in many ways trying to make up for the unbalanced playing field we've had at the, at the federal level. In California, probably the, the most significant renewable energy law uh, that we've had uh, is the Renewable Portfolio Standard. It started with a goal of 20% renewables by 2013. Uh, then the first law that Jerry Brown signed when he came into office again in, in 2011 was a 33% RPS. And by the way, I happened to be at the state uh, legislature on the day that was voted. I, went, I was up in the gallery and I was watching that vote and there was a um, conservative legislator who will go unnamed, but he took the bill and he threw it up in the air and there's papers flying. He said, this is crazy, you know, this will never work. So um, I'm sure he was not very happy when the law got raised to 50% by 2030. Um, but the interesting thing is it's, we're getting there. We're now at 27% renewables, not including rooftop solar. If you include rooftop solar, we're at 29%. We don't also include large hydro, in our calculation. Uh, if you include that, we're at 38% renewables uh, in California today. So uh, this has worked, but the 50% number is a very significant one. And the reason for that is when you reach 50%, after that point, actually fossil fuels become the alternative energy, right? You can applaud that, that's a good news. <laughs> uh, no, and that's actually precisely where we're headed. And I think we need to get excited about this goal. This is actually going to become, and already is becoming, uh, a big part of our state's identity as a clean energy uh, leader. So our state has now installed more renewable energy than any other state in the United States. Texas is second. They've done a great job in Texas on wind, and deserve, they deserve a lot of credit uh, for that. But um, you know, you think about the calamities that were supposed to befall our state. Uh, you know, the, all the criticism, if we were to go big on renewables, and you know, what were they? It's gonna crash our economy, right? Heard that before? What's happened? Our GDP is growing faster than the national average. It's going to increase unemployment. So what's happened? We've cut unemployment in half in California in the last five years, concurrent with the steepest growth uh, of renewable energy. And it's gonna cause uh, blackouts, right? The grid can't handle this. Well, we haven't had any statewide blackouts since 2001, and that was caused by market manipulation from um, Enron and other companies. So it really, I think, the, it's important to, to note these lessons because the same criticisms and the same arguments are still being made against clean energy in other states and other countries today. And so actually, a good portion of what I think we need to do is just myth busting, that it's possible to clean up the grid and still have a successful economy and, and still keep the grid reliable, right? So with energy efficiency, I want to recognize Jim Sweeney also has just joined us, who's been a longtime leader in energy efficiency. Uh, the story, as you know, we, we were tracking roughly with the country in terms of energy use per capita uh, until the mid-70s. Then you saw this huge reduction in commercial, industrial, and residential, and now we're using about half the energy per capita compared to the rest of the country for a number of reasons. But energy codes that we're doing to make buildings more efficient and appliances more efficient, other research and development have uh, helped with that. That's a big uh, point of pride for the state as well. Um, one example of that is uh, refrigerators, which was actually the first appliance that we regulated. The Energy Commission was born 40 years ago um, and the origin story is we had at that time, 40 years ago, uh, electric demand was growing at 8% a year. And everyone said, what are we going to do? That's a huge rate. Uh, and they, they, the legislature asked the RAND Corporation to do a study. The RAND Corporation came back and said, your answer is build 40 nuclear plants. The legislature said, no, thank you. We're going to get big on energy efficiency. Um, energy Commission was born. The first appliance that we regulated was the refrigerator, the biggest energy hog in your house. The refrigerator industry's response was, we'll go bankrupt, it'll be a disaster. We went ahead, we did it. Here's what happened. This is energy use. This is energy use prior to the standard. This is energy use in the refrigerator after the standard. But at the same time, the price of the refrigerator came down and the size of the refrigerator went up. 
So you get refrigerators that are cheaper, uh, more efficient, uh, and and uh, and uh, and better. So this is this is an example, I think, of how smart regulation can can work. And of course, we did the same thing um, with televisions in 2009. My advisor, Ken Ryder, uh, was uh, the lead on this, but. Uh, that standard, which basically said to the TV manufacturers, you want to sell your product to our 40 million customers, you have to meet this really strict new energy efficiency code, cut the energy use of televisions in half, saves a billion dollars a year, and nobody knows about it. <laughs> okay, But it is helping, and that's the reason why we don't have more polluting power plants, is because of this kind of thing. Same thing, uh, by the way, with plug-in chargers. Anybody who's got a cell phone or a plug-in shaver, up until 2012, you plug that device in the wall, when it's fully charged, it would continue to use a little bit of power. Why? Because there's a 25 cent shutoff diode that fixes that problem entirely that the manufacturer is electing not to install because they don't care, they don't pay the energy bill, we do. So we said, no, you can't sell your product into our state without that shutoff diode. That saves $300 million a year, right? So this is all kind of work that's going on beyond, under, the, under the scenes here. But um, this is a chart from Department of Energy which shows the cost declines in what I would call sort of the, the foundational technologies of a clean energy future, which is wind and, and distributed PV, uh, utility scale PV, uh, storage costs and LEDs, and all headed very steeply downward in price. And I think it's worth remembering, you know, when you step back, finite resources, natural resources like oil and gas and coal, over the long haul as they're depleted, increase in price, right? technologies as they scale decrease in price. And that's exactly what we're seeing. There's actually, I think, a lot more cost reduction to come in these renewable technologies. But just as an example, President Obama just finished his, his term in office two weeks ago. I think everyone is aware of that. <laughs> uh, and just over the course of his presidency, since he was sworn in in January of 2009, the price of wind and solar have both fallen by about 75%, right? Which is great news. And that's, again, credit to us all getting to scale. I want to also congratulate Arun Majindar, who was instrumental in, in running our RPE and helping uh, the United States really get to scale on clean energy. That helped accelerate this cost reduction. But I believe there's actually a lot more cost reduction to come, and that comes with scale. So this is the role of California and our sister states around the country is critical uh, in this. Uh, again, just to show you how quickly it's, the change is happening, we had just 12% renewables uh, in the state of California in 2008. Uh, last month, we had 27%. Uh, again, including you know, uh, rooftop solar and large hydro, we're actually at 38% renewables. We don't count, of course, nuclear. With Diablo Canyon, we're at 48% uh, without emissions, which is a great, uh, great success story. So I like this Chinese problem. The people who say it can't, can't be done should get out of the way of the people who are doing it. Uh, I want to take you guys on a California clean energy tour just so you can see some of the projects that are providing all this renewable energy. This is the world's um, largest thin film solar PV project. I dedicated this with the Secretary of Interior about, about two and a half years ago. It's a first solar project um, called Desert Sunlights just north of our border with Mexico. And the interesting thing about this facility is if you go the southern half of the facility, all the PV has frames on it, okay? And then they figured out halfway through that project how to eliminate the frame. So they have frameless modules, and so the second half doesn't have frames. The, this whole site was graded, okay? So they have a bulldozer that literally flattens the whole site. That's actually 15% of the project cost. Going forward, they figured out how to avoid grading altogether. And this is actually, this is a fixed tilt project, so these are not uh, on a tracker. Uh, in the solar industry, the efficiency of the solar panels has to be up at a certain level in order to be justified, the extra cost to go on a tracker. Halfway through this project, they actually reach that efficiency level, so all first solar projects going forward are on trackers. And just, this is, I'm just saying this, just over the course of construction of a single project, there's all of this game-changing innovation which is making future projects cheaper. And so now, solar projects going in today in California that are, are down to $25 a megawatt hour. And this is, these are projects that were $250 a megawatt hour, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, right? This is, uh, at the time, this was the world's largest uh, crystalline silicon solar PV project. It's now um, the third largest, uh, bigger project in China 
And India has just been installed, which is great news. We want to see a lot of competition for who can have the biggest. This is a project um, made by SunPower, uh, one of our leading solar manufacturers here in the Bay Area. And we are also home in California to the world's largest solar thermal uh, power plant, the Ivanpah Project. Raise your hand if you've seen this fine out of Las Vegas. Yeah, OK. So this is uh, what you're looking at. There are three 550-foot towers surrounded by 100 and 70,000 heliostat mirrors. The light hits the mirrors, focuses the light to the boiler at the top of the tower. When it's energized, it's the second brightest thing visible from the face of the Earth after the sun. So you can't look at it without uh, sunglasses. Uh, not a lot of those being built. The cost is, is, is a lot more than PV. We are also home in California to the world's largest solar thermal trough power plant, uh, the SEGS project. This is actually not a new technology. This is 30 years old uh, and still uh, going strong. I think a real testimony to, to the durability of, uh, of renewables. And we're home in California to the world's largest geothermal power plant, uh, the geysers. This is about a gigawatt in size. So roughly about uh, the amount of power that a city like San Francisco uh, would use. Um, and we're home in California to the world's largest uh, wind project, the Alta Wind Energy Center, which is about a gigawatt and a half in Kern County. When you think Kern County in California, uh, you think oil, right? Largest oil producing county in state. This is actually the second biggest taxpayer now in Kern County is this wind project. So um, really, with almost every category of renewable energy technology, California has the largest project uh, in the world. In biomass, we have the largest in the, in the nation. Um, this is actually a joint uh, biomass geothermal plant called Honey Lake. And it's funny, what you're looking at there is a truck that gets the biomass material um, and tilts it up and they empty it that way. And we were there, the, the driver had gotten in trouble because he kept his, he stayed in the cab with his teenage son for the ride. Uh, so, uh, but that's, <laughs> I don't think normally allowed. Um, one other promising trend is the reduction in impacts that we're seeing with renewables. Every form of energy generation in the world has an environmental impact, including renewables. Uh, but one of the things we're seeing, for example, with wind is some improvements there. So um, this is a project called Vasco, which is about uh, two hours east of us. And they had 432 of these older, smaller wind turbines. So these are typically 150 kW uh, turbines that had a lattice structure, right? So that was actually a perching opportunity for birds and very, very fast uh, RPM, about 45 RPM. The new turbines, as you know, have a solid steel column. Birds can't perch there, and much, much slower, about 12 to 14 RPM. So they repowered the site, which means they removed all the old turbines and replaced them with just 34 of the new turbines. And what they found is it tripled the energy production because the new turbines are so much more efficient, and they cut the bird kill uh, by 70%. So a real good example of, of what can be done. And this is now happening around the state as we're repowering older uh, wind projects. Uh, I mentioned also uh, wind, but one opportunity for California is actually offshore wind. So this is a project I visited about two months ago uh, called Deepwater Wind, which is the nation's first offshore wind project, uh, which just got installed off the coast of Rhode Island. So it's about three miles off the coast in about 95 feet of water. Uh, and the interesting thing, so this is about 30 megawatts, six it's five, six megawatt turbines. Um, and the interesting thing about offshore wind for California, we have a different shelf. The East Coast has a shallow water shelf. The West Coast has a deep water shelf. So you actually can't uh, set the turbines into the seabed. It's too deep. But there's a new technology, actually, which comes, interestingly, out of the oil industry, uh, which is basically an oil rig uh, type where it's floating platform that's then tethered to the seabed. And you can put the wind turbine on that. And the interesting thing with that is you can then move it 15 miles offshore. What happens at 15 miles? It's not visible, right? You remember Cape Wind, the project that got killed off the coast of Cape Cod? Well, if people can't see it, that issue really goes away. And the avian impact issue uh, really goes away. And so uh, the resource actually offshore for wind is much, much better than onshore. So, we use a capacity factor in energy, which is basically the percentage of hours in the day when it's generating power. Onshore is about 
uh, the hours in the day offshore is, is 50%. So it's a great resource and it's very complementary to solar. So it's way up in the morning, way down in the middle of the day, and then up again in the afternoon and evening. So um, I think there is going to be some offshore wind put in, in California. You can see the different types of the technologies that are in the seabed. This is the one that, that's just tethered to the seabed with uh, those high tension cables. Uh, another interesting note, the largest manufacturing facility operating in the state of California today is an electric car factory, Tesla. So we actually just had, had uh, lunch there today at Tesla and I worked in Silicon Valley right across the street uh, in Fremont for uh, a company that, that was right across the street when it was the NUMI plant. So that was at the time a joint venture of Toyota and General Motors. It was the largest auto manufacturing facility west of the Mississippi. They closed their doors in 2010. Everyone thought that's the end of car manufacturing in, in California. Tesla came in, bought the plant. There's more people working in that factory today making electric cars than worked there when it was a General Motors plant. Incredible success. And altogether, I think the Elon Musk empire now has 37,000 employees, which is extraordinary. Uh, and we have about a quarter million electric vehicles uh, on the road in California today. And I will just say, I think, one of the things that we most need to do in the next few years is ramp up our adoption and incentives for electric vehicles. It's actually not just because transportation emissions are the largest single chunk of our emissions in the state, but also because for renewable integration, this is critical. Because as you get vehicles with longer ranges, people can be flexible, a little more flexible about when they charge. And you want to be charging when we have uh, really cheap renewables coming onto the grid and can help integrate um, wind and solar. You know, of the family of renewables, right, it's kind of like raising a, raising a family. You know, you have solar and wind have kind of graduated from high school and they're out of the house and their, you know, costs are low. Geothermal and biomass and some of the others are, are not there yet. And so I think we're really going to be in a principally solar and wind powered world, but that makes energy storage and electric vehicles uh, even more important. In new construction, we're also seeing uh, some great trends too. Almost a quarter of the homes in Southern California now being built with solar. We build about 100,000 uh, new homes in the state today. And ultimately, we're going to push to do zero net energy and code uh, around 2020. One of the interesting benefits of all this is the job creation. Uh, so the job census comes out officially tomorrow. Uh, and for California, it will say we have 100,000 solar employees in the state of California today. Uh, that's up from just, you know, four or 5,000, 10 years ago. You add up all of the utility employees, that's from all 43 of our publicly owned utilities and all three of our investor owned utilities providing electric service, there are only 57,000, right? So more solar employees than there are utility employees in California today. And you look at the generation where we're going, uh, this is the estimate of what the resource mix will be. Uh, by 2020, you can see so the biggest change is solar PV, that tan band um, in the middle. Uh, really, solar is going to be about half of all the renewables generated uh, that the utilities are procuring by uh, 2020. And, and solar and wind together will be the vast majority. And the main thing going on there is just, you know, solar PV is just seen an incredible cost reduction. And that's really driven by three things. It's innovation automation and scale, all three of those things are happening. I would argue actually scale's been the most uh, significant driver of that. Uh, but I think there's a lot more cost reduction still to come. I touched on energy storage. One of the things we've also done in the state is establish an energy storage mandate. So 1.3 gigawatts of energy storage by 2020. This is the Tesla battery factory, which is in Sparks, Nevada. It's connected by rail to uh, Fremont. So the, the idea is that they will be manufacturing batteries there and ship them by rail to, to the car factory. Just to give you a sense of how big this facility is. So this is the second largest building in the world that they're constructing. The largest is the Boeing factory. Um, this facility, when I was there a couple months ago, was about, I think, maybe 18% complete. Uh, they were already building batteries in the section of the building that had been finished. And they'd already cut their battery manufacturing costs by 30%, just getting to scale. So incredible success. And that's going to serve both um, the home energy and, and, and uh, commercial energy storage market as well as electric vehicles. 
Oh, how, how many? It's many, many football fields. I couldn't tell you. I mean, probably to walk from one end to the other is, you know, I don't know, seven, eight minutes. It's a huge, huge, huge building. Uh, and that's only, as I said, that's only one. So the whole building will probably be about four times that size. Yeah, it's colossal. So I, I play basketball. I, I really, Steve Nash is one of my favorite point guards. And I think of actually energy storage as sort of like a good point guard in ba basketball. You want to pass to the, to the scores like solar and wind. And, uh, and so that's actually why uh, I'm nowhere near as good as Steve Nash, just to be clear. <laughs> that's why I'm in this job. Uh, but um, that's actually why we're investing at the Energy Commission uh, a great deal into uh, energy storage. Uh, because it really can help facilitate uh, a much higher penetration of, of renewables. And one of the interesting developments that's, that's happened is we're now seeing solar and storage combined. This is a, uh, a new technology just came on the market of, of actually putting uh, energy storage uh, with PV. So you, because, you know, the thing, when you think about, we build the whole electric system in the state, and this is true nationwide, really for peak, right? That's what uh, we build transmission for and so on. And when we have to cycle on gas peakers, that is the single most expensive, single most polluting, single least efficient generation that we have. And so being able to meet those peak needs with energy storage and clean technologies uh, goes a long, long way, both in terms of cost and, and emissions. We've seen also some great uh, solar leadership. President Obama put uh, solar on the White House. We'll hope those panels stay there. Uh, and. Uh, Actually, it's a funny story. I, I had a friend who installed uh, solar um, actually during the, do you guys remember the story? Carter had put them up, Reagan took them down. And then at the very end of the Clinton administration, the National Park Service started this project to, to put them on the White House. Um, and uh, I think that uh, after they got them up there, my, my friend who was doing the job, he said he installed them in a way that they could never be removed. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he like, <laughs> took the bolts out. But anyways, President Obama expanded the system uh, maybe a year or two ago. And then Governor Brown just, um, just put solar on the governor's mansion in Sacramento. Um, one of the other things that the state of California is doing is called the Under Two MOU, which is a memorandum of, of understanding with other states and regions around the world to commit to emissions reductions, which will keep us below two degrees of, of uh, global temperature in increase. We now have 166 signatories that represent 35% of global GDP onto that. So you know, no matter what happens with the Paris Agreement, this is in force and it's still growing. Uh, and I think it's an example of how important state leadership uh, is at this moment. I think the other long-term goal really is, you know, as we, we press to 100% renewables, is also the electrification of almost everything. And I think we should think about the electric grid kind of like what the internet has become, where it's a communications um, medium, it's a, it's a medium for commerce, it's a medium for entertainment, it kind of serves everything, right? The grid actually has the chance to take on the responsibilities and the services that are now provided by diesel and gasoline and, and oil and so forth. And uh, as an example, you know, this is a couple projects we have funded at the Energy Commission. This is a bus made by Proterra, California Electric Bus Company. The bus has a 350 mile range. And we have a thousand national bus services in the United States. And I would venture to say that 99% of them have a, have a a bus route that's shorter than 350 miles. Um, that's on the market today. This is the company Zero Motorcycles that makes an electric motorcycle. Tesla, the Model 3 is coming out next year, 215 mile range, $35,000 cost. And th this is the electric bike that I got. I'm like the slowest biker you could ever imagine. So I live in Berkeley on the hills and I have a couple daughters and I got one of those little attachments, the half bike that kind of snaps on, to, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, with this electric bike, which I'm loving, and I'm, I'm going up the hill, and this biker is like, you know these kind of people, wear, they dress like they're racing the Tour de France, you know, matching up. <laughs> I passed this dude with my kid on the back. He didn't know I was driving an electric bike. I felt great, so. Uh, <laughs> so let's keep that secret here. Um, so we have about 9,000 electric vehicle charging stations in California, many more on the way, and I think the electrification of transportation in, particularly, in particular is, is gonna be um, a real point of focus uh, in the next few years. 
Stanford University, of course, you guys should be incredibly proud uh, with, with this um, retrofit you've just done to essentially move beyond natural gas for your space heating and your, your water heating, which I understand has reduced um, greenhouse gas emissions by two thirds and your energy bills by about one third. Um, and we're also now seeing a trend towards the all electric home. So this is a home made by a company called City Ventures in LA. And you think about your typical home has four appliances that use natural gas, your furnace, your water heater, your dryer in some cases, and your stove. And what they're finding is for the first three appliances, people don't really care. You know, you're, if your water's hot, your water's hot, your house is warm, you're happy. The stove is a different thing. People are used to cooking with gas. I have a nice gas range, I really like it. So what they do, um, there's a really, really uh, interesting Neat uh, new technology, the induction oven. All like, raise your hand if you've used an electric induction. Hand, handful of you guys. Uh, so, anyways, it heats up instantly, it cools instantly. Actually, they cook really, really well. But people, there's a kind of customer adoption challenge. And so, what the builder does, he brings in a four-star chef who cooks an amazing meal for all these prospective home buyers, and uh, then they're they're sold. What they find is um, it's four thousand five hundred dollars of avoided cost when you build an all electric home because you don't have to run gas pipe to the property and then run pipe inside the home, right? So um, we're also seeing, I think, some really exciting leadership in the private sector to move beyond fossil fuels, which is part of the strategy right now. I mean, you know, absent federal leadership, what states can do in the private sector is pretty phenomenal. Companies like Google and Apple and GM and Facebook and Walmart have committed to 100% renewable energy. Apple is already at 100% for their domestic facilities. They're at 93% globally, and they're even going way upstream and building wind and solar to power the factories in China. They're making the iPhone. Um, and ultimately, I think their corporate goal, I think is probably the boldest, which is to build enough renewable energy to power not just their operations, but the energy used by every single um, Apple device. And there's now a billion you know, uh, iPhones in the world. So. Um, and we're seeing a lot of progress also with fossil fuel divestment. So that went from basically uh, not be, there not being hardly any in 2011 to now we have $5 trillion of fossil fuel divestment uh, globally. This is where we are. This is a real product. My, my, my wife is Chinese and um, her, her brother uh, in China took this picture. This is an actual product in China. They sell you now an air filter for when you're biking. And it's just like... If that's a product, we have a problem, you know? And, but this is where we are, and this is why I think the stakes are so, are so high. Um, another area of, of, I think, really commendable leadership is what the military has been doing. Um, we have about 30 military bases in our state, um, and there, there actually have been great pilot grounds for new technologies. I think we funded projects on maybe nine military bases around the state. Um, the Navy has a goal to get to 50% renewables by 2020. Remember, our state goal is 50% by 2030. The Marines uh, have a goal to have zero fossil fuel at all use on their base by 2025. They'll use fuels for the missions, but not for the operation of the base. And they're piloting crazy things. The backpacks, these kinetic backpacks, as the backpack is moving, it's generating power. And they're, that's, so they're actually, they're doing some really pioneering, uh, some pioneering things. And of course, we're building uh, high-speed rail in California. Uh, the commitment has been made for that service to be provided 100% with electricity that will be 100% renewable. And every single station on the high-speed rail network will be a zero net energy uh, building. Uh, just to keep in mind about how quickly the transition can happen uh, in the private sector, you know, just take a look at General Motors. It took you know, over a century for them to become a, a $50 billion company. Tesla you know, was just started in 2003. And you know they're they're already at 35, 30, probably more. I haven't checked. I think their stock price has gone up another 10 billion since I did the slide. But you know, play this out. And you know, I, my my belief is Tesla is going to be more valuable than General Motors. Uh, just the the growth trends that we're seeing. So one other thing we're seeing, which has been a benefit to the state, is that um, clean tech venture capital in California is actually now more than all of Europe and all of China combined. This state, because of our policies, has become the destination for clean tech venture capital. So much of it actually born here in, in Stanford in Silicon Valley. Um, 
And, I'm, and I'll wrap up here just a few thoughts. We are, you know, we've had these rains, but the drought remains kind of a long-term challenge. And it is worth noting uh, one of the single largest uses of water in the United States is thermal power plants. And as we move to a renewable future, that actually significantly reduces our water use uh, and worth always bearing, bearing that in mind. Let me just close with a few stories that have uh, inspired me just about the sense of possibility. Um, I grew up in the summers visiting my grandfather who lived in the Adirondack Park in upstate New York, which is the largest state park in the country, about 100 miles across. It's where I learned how to swim and to fish and really to love the outdoors. And uh, there was a huge problem with the Adirondacks and much of the Northeast from acid rain. Why? What happened in the Midwest, these coal plants, to deal with a local air pollution problem, their solution was build a higher smokestack. So <laughs> in the 70s, they started to build taller and taller stacks, which got the emissions up into the jet stream. Comes down as acid rain. There's 1,800 lakes in the Adirondack Park and 25% of them died. They could not support fish life, right? Then George Bush Sr., to his great credit, uh, passed this uh, cap and trade program, and it, uh, it worked. Uh, significant cut, I think three quarters uh, of the emissions got cut. Those lakes that had died in the Adirondacks are coming back to life through smart policy, bipartisan policy. Um, the ozone hole as well, uh, you remember in 1987, um, the world came together and signed the Montreal Protocol to deal with this problem of chlorofluorocarbons. George Schultz, who is here at Stanford, was instrumental in that success and in negotiating that. Um, and we would all be subject to much higher uh, threat from skin cancer were it not for this. And now, because of that agreement, we're on track for the ozone hole to completely restore by 2050. But the analogy that I think holds most closely to the challenge we face from fossil fuels today is what happened with smoking in the United States. So. In World War II, we gave every soldier in the war a pack of cigarettes as part of daily rations. So a generation of men came home from the war uh, as smokers. And smoking was mainstream. Johnny Carson smoked. Fred Flintstone smoked. Doctors did ads for cigarettes. President Kennedy smoked. Marilyn Monroe smoked. Some people say they smoked together. <laughs> <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then um, the science came out that smoking causes cancer and that secondhand smoke causes cancer, okay? The response of the tobacco industry was to go from making one product, cigarettes, to making two products. They manufactured cigarettes and they manufactured doubt. They manufactured doubt. They spent $100 million on junk science to distort that basic truth that smoking causes cancer because it's a threat to their business model. But what happened next is very instructive because eventually uh, the science became indisputable and public opinion changed and it led to a cascade of policies, starting with health warnings on packaging in 1965 to banning advertisements on uh, TV for cigarettes. 1970s, the cigarette tax increasing, banning of smoking in, in airplanes and sales to minors and in bars and restaurants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now we've gone from almost half the country smoking to 15% and falling. It's really one of the great public health uh, success stories in our country's history. And I think this is precisely where we are um, with moving beyond fossil fuels. So I'll close with this. Uh, this last summer, I took my wife and kids to Sequoia National Park. Raise your hand if you've been to Sequoia. If you've, oh, look, wow, good. <laughs> oh, you tree huggers here, this is. <laughs> um, so this is the largest tree in the world, the General Sherman tree. And it uh, actually is, it weighs twice the student body of, of, of Stanford University. Uh, <laughs> if you go into this tree, there's these cones, they're about the size of an egg, with little seeds. And you see the seed is about the size of a, of a grain of rice. And just remember that the largest thing in the world starts small, and I think that's true of social movements as well. And what we're doing here in California can spread to the world. So I'll close there. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, David. So we have time for a couple quick questions. Any student questions? No questions? <laughs> Internship? <laughs> Those are one in the back. Go ahead. Um, 
So I'm working for EDF, the French Power Utility, leader on the nuclear mm -hmm. uh, in the world. So my question is regarding the, the nuclear. How do you see the place of uh, nuclear energy to meet maybe the 50% that are not um, addressed by the renewable? Yeah, thank you. So the question was about nuclear power. So in California, we built five nuclear plants. Uh, four of them have been shut down. The last remaining one is Diablo Canyon. That's been announced to shut down in 10 years. Uh, by the way, there was a, the, the last two plants to have the shutdowns were, it's sort of like the wrong way to do it and the right way to do it. The, the Songs, the San Onofre plant uh, that was shut down two years ago, they spent like $700 million trying to fix this thing. That failed. Then they shut down instantly and had to be replaced with 50% gas. Diablo Canyon was planned, uh, and uh, that's going to shut down in 10 years and be replaced with 100% renewables. I don't see a future in California for nuclear uh, just because of the cost. It's, it's not competitive. I think there will be some nuclear built in other states. I think Georgia is doing a little bit right now. But I think what we're seeing with the cost reduction for energy storage and the cost reduction for wind and solar, uh, it's going to be very difficult for nuclear to compete on price alone. So, yeah, here we go. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, could you go back to the uh, cost reduction chart you had? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. All right. So, j just a wish for the DOE and whenever you use them, can you do that with a log scale? Okay. The logs here, okay. okay. Well, but the, re the reason, as I'm an old technology guy, we always did technology trends on log scales. Because otherwise, the things tend to look like they're flattening out when they aren't really. Because often the ratios matter more than the absolute costs. So anyway, it's, a, it's just a wish. You know, I'm not sure where that is. Okay. Leaving. Okay. Point taken. Okay. <laughs> okay, one more question back here. Um, electric chart on the natural gas peakers. Um, so we have 20 gigawatts of, of simple cycle gas in, in California. Uh, we also have 20 gigawatts of combined cycle gas. And right now, for this past year, uh, one plant, the Sutter Energy Center, was mothballed for the whole year because it's not needed. Uh, so what I'm wondering is, for natural gas in California, as we grow the renewables uh, more and more, what are we going to do for all these plants that are that are there now and are not being used, basically? Their capacity factors are dropping like a rock. Yeah, that's a great point. <coughs> um, no, and there will be retirements. I think that, that is part of what happens. But it has to happen in a planned way. Uh, I think that natural gas um, for long-range vehicles can play a role in terms of actually the, the – what the fuel can do, I think EVs are not so suited for, for that. But no, there are going to be uh, gas plant retirements. There already have been. Um, but I think the goal for the state is to do that in a way that's planned and, um, and gradual. So, sorry, so why are we, why are we building new, new natural gas? Well, the retrofits that you're seeing now, and again, I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, not inclined to build any more gas than, than absolutely necessary, but the retrofits you're seeing now are principally having to do with water use. They're using fresh water along the coast, and, or they're using uh, seawater, and so they're, the once-through cooling plants are being retrofitted to be dry-cooled uh, rather than actually just a new plant where there wasn't one. Great. Uh, David, thanks for an uplifting talk, which is just what we need nowadays. Thank you.